This year, I got accepted to many top medical schools, including my dream school, because I did well on the AMC preview. Now, if you haven't heard of it, the AMC preview is a situational judgment test, an SJT. Basically, that means it's like an ethics test, and it's becoming increasingly used at different medical schools in the United States, like UCLA and St. Louis University. You can imagine if the Casper test, which might be a little bit more familiar to you, if that test was in a multiple choice format, then you'd have something like the AMC preview. You basically get 30 different scenarios and out of those 30 scenarios you're given sub questions for every scenario and you have to give you know each of those sub questions a ranking between one to four is it a very effective strategy for that ethical scenario or is it not a very effective strategy for that ethical scenario you can imagine the amc preview is like if the casper test was multiple choice the casper test is a more popular ethics test that's also used for medical schools and beyond and the way that AMC preview works is it has 30 scenarios and each scenario has a bunch of sub questions. Each sub question is an action that you can take and you give it a rating between one to four, which is very ineffective to very effective for that course of action for that specific scenario. So I have to get a great score on it. A good score on the AMC preview is considered a six to a nine with a very good score being considered a seven to a nine. And doing well in the AMC preview came down to seven main things for me. I'm gonna start off with the very general and then I'm gonna get to the secret sauce that really helped me get a good score. All right, so let's get into it. The number one rule is to know the instructions by heart. So there's one or two pages of instructions before you get into the test. You need to know these by heart. A lot of people just jump into the test, you know, they read the scenarios, they look at the questions, they think, all right, I know what a good answer is, boom, 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 and then they get surprised when they don't do that well. What you need to do is fully understand the instructions. The test is always asking you, what's the next best step? So sometimes there's a good idea in there, but it's not actually the next very best step. The second thing is you need to look at the definitions. So you need to know what the difference is between say like an effective answer and a very effective answer. For example, there might be a scenario and then one of the sub questions gives you kind of like a bad idea. But the thing is, even if you do it, you're not going to make things worse. It's just not going to fix anything. That's usually ineffective because if it did make things worse, then that is what it would take to make it a very ineffective answer. So you need to make sure those definitions are ingrained into your head for test day and just, you know, memorizing that one or two sheet instruction sheet was a big step in helping me really get a big boost in my score. The second tip is to always address the root cause of the issue. A lot of times, different sub questions, one of them will kind of address the consequences of an issue, right? Like the symptoms, for example, of an issue, but another one will actually go to the root of the issue. So for example, if you have a group member and they're not really pulling the rate and you know there's something going on in their personal lives, if you just take care of their workload and whatnot, that is not addressing the issue, the root cause, it's just kind of addressing the symptoms of the issue. You know, okay, I can help you, I can take care of your workload this week, for example. But addressing the root of the issue would have been to maybe talk with that individual, see if you can help get them some counseling or some support. That is what's gonna really help address the root of the issue so something like that doesn't happen again. Simply helping them out, even being kind to them, you know, that's just addressing the symptoms of the issue. So that's really the, the difference often between effective and very effective is if you actually go to the root of the issue and address that. The third tip is to never forget your duties as a medical student. So if you look at the instructions, your role in this entire test is as a medical student. So if you have an exam on some day or you have some mandatory PBL problem-based learning session on some sort of day and it conflicts with, you know, even the most important thing, for example, the president of the United, of the United States is gonna come and sign an autograph or, you know, is gonna come shake your hand or something. It doesn't matter. You need to attend to your duties as a medical student. In a lot of scenarios where you have conflicting demands, often just skipping the secondary obligation and just sticking to what you have to do as a medical student, that is enough to be effective. However, it's then what you can do to maybe find a way to meet both or see if you can reschedule the secondary obligation. Being proactive is really the difference to get you to very effective as a strategy instead of just effective. But it's always effective to you know, skip out on your secondary obligation and just focus on what you have to do as a medical student in most cases. Tip number four, avoiding dealing with the situation is almost always very ineffective. This may seem very obvious to you, but it can be disguised in different ways. For example, making excuses or say, you know, you have a group member who's not pulling their weight. Maybe you just do their work for them and really never address it. Or for example, you ask the professor, can you move this group member to another group? These are all ways of avoiding to deal with the main issue. Why isn't that group member not working? You know, can you talk with them? Can you have certain discussions with them? See if you can help them out. That's addressing the root issue. And by, you know, going to the professor saying, all right, remove this group member or not communicating. These are ways that you're actually avoiding dealing with the main issue. And it's almost always a very ineffective answer. Tip number five, and this one was a little bit hard for me to do, especially as someone who thinks, you know, I'm a kind of a chill guy, you know, I'm not too, 
I'm not, you know, a tattletale or whatnot, but you always have to report when you got to report. So if there's like a patient privacy violation, if there's some sort of code of conduct, professionals in violation, that's pretty serious. Maybe there's some legal matters involved. Maybe there's drugs being brought into, uh, you know, the professional environment, even if it's drugs that are, you know, maybe be popular on the street, right? Like marijuana in a state where it's not really allowed. You got to report where you got to report. And it's almost always a very effective answer when you say, you know what, I'm going to have to report this to the respective uh, authorities in the situation. Tip number six was understanding the difference between calling people out and actually discussing an issue with them. So for example, calling people out is always usually ineffective or very ineffective depending on how you do it. For example, if someone has social anxiety or they're not good in groups and then you call them out in the middle of the group, that could be very ineffective. Just calling someone out, you know, hey, you're doing this wrong and it's terrible in that kind of, you know, rude way, not too much of a respectful way, not too much of a critical, you know, providing a feedback kind of way. If you don't do that, then that's usually ineffective. However, if you take the time to be respectful and actually explain why something is wrong, instead of just telling someone, that is usually effective, right? You're not really addressing the root issue or being proactive or, or anything, but at least you're telling them in a respectful manner, that's usually effective. So you gotta pay attention to exactly how those sub questions work. The course of action, are they saying, you know, you're going to this person and you're telling it to them in an angry fashion, or maybe you're being a little bit irreverent, not too respectful, or are you actually explaining why something is wrong or explaining how others may feel? You know, that's the difference between something that's effective versus something that's ineffective, or maybe even very ineffective if you're saying it in a rude way or in a way that could be very troublesome. And lastly, number seven, and this one kind of took me a long time to wrap my head around, and it's kind of a repeat of the first tip I gave you, but you'll see the difference, is to always isolate the sub question as a next step. So for example, there's a lot of times where, you know, there's a lot of good ideas given for any sort of scenario, but you gotta be able to isolate that idea and think, okay, if this is the only thing I were to do, right? If this were done in isolation as the immediate next step in the scenario, how effective would it be just by itself? And the thing is, if something's a good idea, but it's not a good idea in isolation, it doesn't really get much done. If you were to only do that one thing, right, right after in that scenario, then it's pretty hard to justify it as an effective or very effective answer. For example, in the practice in the sample AMC package, there's a scenario about you have a friend who's making rude comments about patients online, right? And one of the possible next steps is to go and research to see if they've made more comments about other patients. So this is not a bad idea, right? This is something you should probably do at some point. But if you were to consider, okay, this is the immediate next step, you know, does it really solve anything? No, it doesn't. Right? So this wouldn't be an effective or very effective answer. So once you start looking at these sub items in isolation and looking at them, all right, in isolation, is this a good next step? What does this really address? That's when you're going to really start seeing increases in your score because you're going to be able to effectively analyze how good these sub items are as immediate next steps, which is exactly what the instructions want you to do. That's it y'all. For practice, I would really recommend a website called The Bright Doctor. It has over 100 scenarios and 500 sub items and rationales, you know, it's expert designed. It can really help you practice, create custom practice tests to get into the group of things for test day to learn the kind of logic that they're going to test and to make sure that, you know, you're on your game. Because it's really customizable, I would typically just practice five scenarios at a time and this will let me fit in a lot of practice for the AMC preview during small chunks of time throughout my day. You can also go to the past test section of the website and you can review your answers, see the rationale, see why you got things wrong, or if you got them right, you know, refine that kind of line of thinking. So it's gonna help you out on test day. Other than that, I wish everybody the best and I'll catch you in the next one.